All right, perfect. Um, so my name is Emma. Um, I am a uh, fourth year medical student, um, getting ready to, to graduate fairly soon. Um, so um, today we're going to talk a little bit about um, esophageal disorders. So um, it, it'll be, um, it's kind of a broad uh, topic. So like a, a few sessions ago, I decided to, to really focus on um, mini cases. So today we're going to do three mini cases. Um, it kind of focuses on um, internal medicine, um, truly, because that's all I really talk about. Um, but um, kind of a, a subset of internal medicine, which is gastroenterology. So we're going to talk about um, uh, the esophagus tonight, um, kind of a few pathologies that go along with it, and, and hopefully teach you guys something. Um, cool. So let me um, uh, send the um, the pre poll for you. So um, take a few seconds here to, to kind of um, vote um, what you know about esophageal disorders, um, whether that's um, a lot or a little or, or nothing, um, that's totally okay. All right, it looks like most of you guys are in, so I'll end the poll here and, and share the results with you. So it looks like most of you are kind of, you know, caught between um, I know nothing or you know a little, and that's okay. Um, you know, going into medical school, I would say I probably, the only thing I knew about the esophagus was that it took food from my mouth to my stomach, and I knew if it felt like I had something stuck in it. Um, so um, if that's where you're at, that's completely okay. Um, hopefully you will, we'll teach you a little bit tonight um, about a few pathologies to kind of enhance your knowledge. Um, and uh, as always, if you guys have questions about anything, um, feel free to send them my way. Um, you know, you can always unmute yourself. That's totally fine with me. Um, or you can um, send something through the chat as well. All right, so in terms of um, what we're gonna talk about um, or you know, what our outline is, um, we are going to, um, I'm gonna introduce something that is new this time. Um, it is, uh, I, I'm gonna start this little segment. Um, it, it's called um, five minute advice. I'm gonna talk for five minutes or so, um, unless you have you know, burning questions um, about, um, uh, medical school application stuff. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the personal statement um, and, and give you a kind of a brief overview of that because um, I know all of you guys or most of you guys who are, are here tonight are applying to medical school at one point or another. And that's really kind of the bulk of what I do with Motivate MD is yes, I teach you guys on Wednesdays sometimes and I do mock interviews, but a lot of what I do is, is editing because um, I do have a passion for writing myself. So um, we'll talk about the personal statement for five minutes here in a few minutes. Um, and besides that, we're going to do a, a case series. We're going to do three cases, kind of talk about the HMP. We'll talk about the ROS physical exam. We'll kind of break down a differential and, and talk about the assessment and plan. And then the next slide after that will be kind of a lesson on the pathology. So we'll give you kind of an overview of a few things tonight. Um, you know, it's not comprehensive by any means, like any of these ses sessions that um, we, we've had with you, but it should give you a good kind of overview and a good introduction to this stuff. Okay, so um, first things first, we'll talk the, the five minute um, advice um, before we kind of um, mark where you guys are at. But in terms of the, the five minute advice, um, we're, we're going to talk about the personal statement today. So um, I love talking about the personal statement um, and, and I've helped, I've been humbled to, to help a lot of uh, students with this because everybody hates the personal statement and that's okay. Um, but where we kind of start is with this introduction here. And that's what this paragraph one is. And, and what we talk about here is um, the narrative lead. So kind of placing the reader in the story that um, you're trying to describe, whether that is, you know, your motivation to become a doctor or, you know, something of which that was foundational in your motivation to become a doctor or, you know, a, a moment that kind of um, can describe uh, why you want to be a doctor. You know, all of these things are uh, how students sometimes make that connection to why they're going to medical school. And you'll find that this is truly a permeating theme throughout your essay. Um, you know, for instance, one of my favorite essays that, that I had the pleasure of reading is um, a student, um, you know, I like the, the essays that kind of, um, 
you know, aren't the norm because I read a lot, you know, not, not far as, as many as admission committees read, but um, I like the ones that stand out because I remember them and, and, you know, they're creative. So one, uh, one essay that a student wrote that I, I worked with was, uh, you know, the student wrote about um, making a kind of parallel to music and choir and how um, doing so allowed you know, healing for, for the audience and how that healing is the same reason why the student wanted to get into medicine. It was a, a brilliant narrative lead and kind of placed the, um, the reader right in the shoes of, of, you know, where the student was at in terms of, um, you know, singing in the choir. So that's what the narrative lead is. It kind of places you in the shoes of, uh, you know, where you were, where you were. Um, and in the thesis kind of makes that connection. It says, you know, this is how this experience relates to my motivation to become a doctor. And this is why I wanna be a doctor. Um, then the body paragraphs are, are really gonna kind of outline, you know, maybe three to four experiences um, that may have reaffirmed your interest in medicine, may have, um, or, you know, kind of highlight or outline um, experiences that you've had, um, characteristics that you've acquired or lessons that you've learned. Um, and, and the goal of all this is to, you know, yes, show your candidacy for medical school, um, but also explain why you want to be a doctor. Then finally, the conclusion kind of makes that connection um, back to the narrative lead in the thesis as well. So I know we kind of ran through this pretty quickly. Um, so if you guys have questions about it, you can always ask. Um, as always, I'll stick around at the end to, to answer any questions as well, but I did want to give you an overview of the personal statement. Um, and if there's any kind of any things that you guys want to talk about during these five minute advice talks, um, you could always put them in the chat as well. And I'd be happy to, to kind of talk about uh, any, any topics here. All right, so let's keep it moving here, kind of talk about the esophagus. Um, so here's our soap note form. Um, I did put that in the chat for you guys. I'll put it in here again. Um, so this is the soap note form that you're going to use if you're new. Um, welcome. Um, thanks for coming. So this is uh, the soap note form, and you're going to fill this out through the throughout the entirety of the talk. Okay. And soap is just a um, an acronym. It's uh, S O A P, obviously. Um, it stands for subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. Um, and it, we we use it kind of as a mechanism to describe, you know, what the patient is is, you know, what the patient's discourse looks like but also you know, to tell um, other medical professionals um, what our point of view is, what we're working this patient up for, and um, you know, what they presented with. So HPI is history of present illness. It's the history that the patient presents with. Um, ROS is the um, pertinent positives and negatives related to the patient's um, presentation. So if they come in chest pain, we might say, um, you know, the patient um, has shortness of breath, but they were negative for uh, diaphoresis, for sweating, um, and negative for nausea and vomiting, okay? Then objective is all the things that um, we find. So things like the vital signs um, and physical exam, all right? Then um, the assessment and plan. Um, assessment is what we think is going on, basically our, our differential diagnosis working things up. Then our plan is how we're going to address that. So if we think our, our patient has, um, due to their chest pain, you know, has elevated troponin, so we say that um, this is a, um, and, and they have a ST segment elevation on their EKG. We say ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, and then how we're going to treat that. Um, then if they have another problem that is hypertension, we might put that as number two and how we're going to manage that hypertension. Okay, so that's what our assessment is of what's going on. And then our plan is what we're going to do to kind of rectify those problems. Okay. Um, and then for tonight, I have three cases, obviously. So choose one to write about. Um, and if you, uh, you know, choose the first one, you can kind of um, relax the rest of the time. If you find that some information is missing, um, I think that is your opportunity to kind of fill in the gaps. Um, and in terms of, you know, you can look up these things and, and kind of fill in what would be there or use the information that's provided to fill out the, the um, soap note to the best of your ability. All right. So let's keep going here. All right, so um, use the annotation tool. So if you go up to annotate and click stamp, um, you can mark where you're at. Um, we'll kind of get a, a good poll of where everybody's at tonight. Lots of pe people on the East Coast. 
but everybody's all over, it looks like. Lots of Canada always. Ah, another Florida, I see. Excellent. All right, perfect. Well, where wherever you guys are at tonight, um, thanks for coming. Um, we're always happy to have you. This is always, you know, a, a uh, highlight of my week. I love, um, you know, teaching you guys, and um, you guys, you know, often teach me something as well. So, um, let's keep going here. All right. So here's the introduction. We're going to kind of talk, you know, a few things about the esophagus before we go into those cases. All right. So, let's start with anatomy. So when we talk about um, the, the esophagus, obviously, um, that's this, this guy over here, um, this cartoon over here. When we talk about the esophagus and, and um, specifically when we're doing um, endoscopy, so when we're, when we're putting a camera you know, through the mouth um, and, and through the esophagus down to the stomach, we often use these measurements that's listed on the left side here. So um, we start that measurement at the incisors, okay? So if we say, um, you know, there's an esophageal mass at um, 17 centimeters, that's based off of the incisors. So the measurement from the incisors to that spot. We use this as kind of a standardized mechanism to um, say where things are. You know, the same way if there was a lesion on the skin, we would measure it and describe it and put it in our chart. Same thing here, we're gonna describe that. Okay, so obviously um, this is our pharynx up here, um, also the mouth, obviously. And then we go down, um, we know that the trachea is anterior to the esophagus, meaning it's in front. Anterior means front, posterior means behind, okay? So uh, trachea is anterior and uh, esophagus is posterior. And then we have um, obviously um, two components of the, tra or of the esophagus. We have smooth muscle, um, and then we have striated muscle. So we um, have kind of this different um, innervation of the esophagus based on smooth muscle and striated muscle. Um, then as we kind of get down, um, this image is kind of showing, you know, in relation to where the aortic arch is. Um, then we get down um, to um, the diaphragm, the uh, esophagus um, uh, uh, passes through the diaphragm. And then we um, now call it the abdominal part of the esophagus, um, kind of appropriately named, obviously. Um, but the, the part that we really look at here is um, this part here, um, and we call that the um, gastroesophageal junction, the GE junction. And that's important for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, up here, um, it doesn't really show it in this, but we have an upper esophageal sphincter up here. Um, and then down here, we have the lower esophageal sphincter, so the LES. Um, and the LES is that point right before the stomach where um, it, it has a, a, a sphincter. So it, it, it basically contracts and relaxes um, based on peristalsis. Um, so the, that smooth muscle that's in the esophagus kind of contracts when a food, a food bolus comes along to propel it down into the stomach. Okay, so that's what's going on there. And then it, it, uh, it loosens up to allow food to go into the stomach. And we're going to talk about it, but whenever the, there's loosening of this lower esophageal sphincter, that's when we start to get stomach acid up into the esophagus and, and you know, things can go awry. So that is the kind of premise of gastroesophageal reflux disease, also known as GERD. Um, we spell it um, G E. RD, my handwriting is obviously excellent tonight. Um, but, and, and as well as other things, and we worry about GERD because um, if the, the esophagus gets exposed to too much stomach acid, then that can lead to a pathological condition that um, we will talk about um, later. Okay, so well, now we'll abandon the esophagus for a second because um, as we, we kind of talked about, the esophagus runs along with the stomach and, and like the esophagus, we see that there are different muscle layers of the actual uh, stomach here. Um, and uh, let, me, let me clear all this real quick. I'm gonna move my chat box. All right, so when we talk about the, um, when we talk about the stomach here, we, um, there's three muscle layers. Um, we know that the esophagus has 
um, two basically smooth muscle and striated muscle that um, are in different parts of the esophagus. Um, but here, what we're seeing, um, let me get my pointer out again. Um, what we're seeing is three different layers. And, and if you notice from this cartoon, um, they're oriented in different directions to kind of in the same way that the esophagus had that peristaltic mechanism, so that these sort of waves to propel, you know, stomach contents, um, the, uh, the stomach does that too. We have this longitudinal layer, we have a circular layer and an oblique layer, kind of, um, you know, able to contract and propel stomach contents. But as we can see, here's our friend, the esophagus, and we have a few main parts of the uh, stomach that are, are kind of landmarks for it. So up here is called the fundus. Um, here's kind of the, we call this a lesser curvature. So the, the kind of a smaller part of it. Over here is the greater curvature. You can probably assume why it's called that. This is kind of a smaller curve. And this is the bigger curve over here. We have these kind of um, gastric folds or rugae of the stomach. Um, that, that kind of increase the surface area of the stomach and are able um, to absorb some nutrients as well and water and other things. Um, and are also used for peristalsis as well. Um, down here is the pylorus. Um, here's our friend, um, the duodenum. Um, and, and you'll hear it called different things depending on who you talk to. Um, the, the gastroenterologist that I'm with now calls it duodenum. Um, so it, it, I guess, I don't know if you're a, a duodenum or duodenum person, but it goes either way. I hear it either way. There's no right or wrong answer. It's kind of like the tomato tomato thing. Um, and obviously here's the, the pylorus and in the sphincter that, uh, is here is the pyloric sphincter. Um, and then it, obviously if you can imagine, um, we have our friend, the pancreas here, um, and then up here um, comes the common bile duct um, that kind of converges with the pancreatic duct. Um, and here's the ampulla um, that dumps into the duodenum. So we know that bile comes from up here um, in the gallbladder um, to the duodenum. Um, and, and so bile is used to emulsify fats, um, kind of break down that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other part is uh, the cardia is up here um, of the stomach, okay? So that's a brief introduction to um, kind of the anatomy. So let's keep going here so we can get into the cases fairly quickly. Um, and here's kind of a, a cartoon that shows um, um, manometry, which is kind of pressure study of the esophagus. Um, the, the cartoon that I have on the right is kind of the old way that we used to do it uh, when there was less, um, uh, pressure tracings in um, the actual probe. Now what we use is um, is this um, mechanism over here to the um, to the left um, where you see these yellow parts, which are all pressure sensors. Um, and we stick this up through the nose, down through the esophagus. And what we're doing is we're asking the patient to um, swallow multiple times. And this kind of um, uh, chart over here, it's called spatiotemporal um, uh, tracing. And, and what we see is we can get a pr pressure trace as a result to see if there's a pressure problem with the esophagus. So we're, we can use it for dysphagia. We can use it for um, different problems with the esophagus to um, determine if there's a, a pressure problem, if there's a problem with the swallowing mechanism. All right. So let's keep going. All right, and then when we talk motility disorders, um, there's lots of different issues. And, and this cartoon over here kind of shows that. Um, we can have you know, a fistula, we can have a traction diverticulum, or we can have a, a web, which is plumber Vinson syndrome, or a um, posterior um, outpouching of the esophagus, which is <clears throat> known as a diver, uh, zanker diverticulum. We find that a lot in, in older people. Um, we can have a stricture as, the, as a result of um, different um, irritants like stomach acid. Um, we can have scleroderma, which is an autoimmune problem. Um, reflex esophagitis. We can have Mallory Weiss, which is a tear in the esophagus. We can have our, um, our friend or not friend, um, Barrett esophagus, when we get um, sort of metaplasia of the esophagus um, cells because of exposure to stomach acid. Um, but, you know, other than that, we can have problems with the lower esophageal sphincter, like hypertensive LES or achalasia, where we get that kind of big bird beak esophagus where, you know, the, the sphincter is so tight, it's not allowing food to kind of go down into the stomach. Um, 
And I think we talked about some of these other ones, but we can, you know, we can get problems with the um, esophagus from, you know, a stroke too, where we damage kind of the um, swallowing mechanism um, or other neuromuscular disorders or, you know, diffuse esophageal spasm is one too. It's a primary um, dysmotility disorder where the esophagus, esophagus kind of just spasms and, you know, um, is very painful for the, the patient. Um, so that's an introduction to some of the pathology. You know, we're obviously going to break down some of these cases and, and really kind of um, dissect them. But um, first things first, let's go through the first case. And if we have somebody to be um, ever so kind to, to read the first case, um, I, would, uh, I would very much appreciate that. A 66-year-old male presents for a long-standing history of heartburn. He notes that he has had this for several years, though has never had treatment for it other than occasional OTC tums, over-the-counter tums. Recently, he has noted some dysphagia and a globus sensation. Since the worsening of his symptoms, he has avoided coffee, spicy foods, and chocolate which has helped, let's get down a bit. I'm trying to go lower. <laughs> That's okay, I'll finish the other part for you. Yeah, physical, physical exam. exam. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, perfect. Or that we're gonna tag team it. Um, so physical exam shows tenderness to palpation in the epigastric region. So that part just right below your sternum, mm -hmm. all right? So good. A few things um, that I want to point out here is, um, let's see. So thanks for reading, by the way. Um, so the, the patient describes dysphagia, which is kind of a, a problem swallowing. Something else the patient talks about is this globus sensation, which um, some patients describe it differently, but it's usually feeling like something is stuck in your throat, like thick secretions maybe, or just a, um, you don't feel like you're getting kind of your secretions all the way down, like something's stuck. Okay. Um, and obviously he avoided um, all of the, the best foods, coffee, spicy foods, chocolate, um, which kind of has helped his symptoms. So um, we know that he's kind of had longstanding heartburn, but um, what questions do you have for this gentleman or what, or and, and or what tests do you want to um, order for this patient, both laboratory and imaging studies? So for someone of whom has longstanding uh, heartburn um, and um, is now having problems swallowing, um, what do you guys think? What, what do you want to get? You can look for um, both labs. We can do labs um, and or imaging. But what do you think? What would you order to kind of figure out what is going on with this patient? Yeah. Does he smoke or drink or have a history of GERD? Good. He says he has heartburn, so maybe he wasn't diagnosed. Um, so Dustin says endoscopy, certainly. Um, yeah. Any esophageal or um, heart disorders in the family? Good. A CT or x-ray to see if there's something stuck? Yeah. X-ray is always a good way to start. So, you know, cheap tests um, to see. Um, we could always ask the patient if they swallowed something. You'd be surprised what people try to swallow. Um, a manometry, yeah, or barium swallow, good, yeah, manometry, yeah, we can see, you know, especially for dysphagia, if there's a pressure problem going on, so I agree with manometry, um, we might want to ask, you know, how long this heartburn has been going on, so we can get that basis to know, um, you know, how long his esophagus has been exposed to acid, um, because as we know, there can be a problem with long-standing um, acid reflux. So good. Um, any labs that you guys want? I know you guys did a lot of imaging um, studies. Um, we have one vote for fecal, um, certainly. What are you looking for there, Josh, with, with the fecal studies? H. pylori, good, yeah. Um, usually for H. pylori, we can do fecal, but we can, um, we usually will do the breath test. Um, it's more sensitive. Um, 
uh, and specific for um, H. pylori. Um, that's an excellent, excellent point. H. pylori is a um, cause of, of stomach re uh, or GERD and, and sort of this indigestion feeling and does cause epigastric pain. Yeah, TSH, we can definitely check a TSH and a CBC. Um, TSH, um, what are you looking for for TSH? Maybe a thyroid problem. Good. Yeah. So why what why would a thyroid problem cause dysphagia? You got to a great point that I was actually going to talk about later, but um, that's an excellent point. And we can talk about it now. So if you, yeah, they can sometimes have difficulty swallowing. Do you know why they might have difficulty swallowing? Yeah, it's enlarged sometimes. So they can have a goiter. Um, and, and we know that the, uh, the thyroid is located about here on the neck. Um, and if it's enlarged, they have a goiter, whether it's, um, you know, a multinodular goiter or because of hypothyroidism or because of Graves disease, um, you know, whatever the etiology, either hypo or hyper, they can have a goiter. And we know that that can cause um, problems following, um, sort of being in close proximity to the esophagus. So excellent. Those are, these are all great points. You guys are all on the right track. Um, so now, um, you know, you guys are like, all right, let's get this um, patient back to endoscopy. And this is what you see. Um, somebody who's uh, very wise out there, um, tell me what you see. And I will tell you that this is um, the GE junction because I can't give you a picture and just assume you, assume you to know where it's at. Um, so Madeline says Barrett's good. Why do you think that? Tell me what you see that would suggest um, Barrett's in this segment. So patches could be neoplastic lesions, certainly. So what we see here um, is we're looking at the GE junction and something that we kind of see here, we call it the Z line. So we see this kind of exaggerated Z line and we see this erythematous mucosa here, erythematous meaning red. So we see it kind of coming up higher here and these patches of, of salmon colored mucosa are actually normal tissue. So we see it kind of creeping upwards and it's kind of, um, you know, erythematous. And, you know, we can't tell that this is Barrett's actually from this, you know, from just saying it, though we can have a suspicion. Okay. So you guys are on the right track. So what would we do in order to determine whether this is in fact Barrett's? How do we confirm it based, you know, we're, we're in looking at it, but how do we determine now? Yeah, good. A biopsy. Excellent. You guys are all on, on the right track here. And um, here you go. Um, if it comes up, oh, there it is. So here's your biopsy. You guys are now like Dr. House, you do everything. You did the endoscopy. Now you're doing the, the biopsy. You're a jack of all traits. So what do you guys see here? I know this is very hard. So if, if you don't have any ideas, we'll go through it together, which I suspect you may not. So I'll go through it. Um, so yeah, so disrupted mucosa, certainly. So what we're gonna see here is this tissue right here. Um, this is normal esophageal mucosa. And this kind of, you know, these are two different images, but they kind of parallel each other, okay? So right here, um, we call this squamous cells. And and I should have put a little cartoon, but squamous cells are kind of like this and they're, they're kind of flattened um, and they have nuclei um, and they're, they're kind of like that. And if they're stratified, they're kind of like this and they're kind of on top of each other. And we know that um, that stratified squamous epithelium, these kind of stacked cells here, and I know the image is kind of small, so forgive me. You can always Google it to, to look at a better resolution photo. Um, but we see the stratified squamous epithelium here in the esophagus. We know that this is a normal part of skin. Um, our skin on the surface is stratified squamous epithelium. It's constantly turning over. Okay, when we think about other cells, um, for instance, the cells in our stomach, the cells in our intestine, they are more um, columnar and they're columnar like this because they have 
um, different roles. Um, they absorb nutrients, they secrete mucin, okay? So these cells over here, would you call them more um, stratified squamous? So the first one we talked about, or would you call it more columnar? Good, I agree with you. I think that is certainly columnar epithelium here. And uh, we it's not a good, I should have blown up the image with you for you. Um, but what we see sometimes is these little um, pits in here and it, it, it stains kind of pale. And those are usually called goblet cells. And that's what secretes the mucus that kind of, um, and the bicarb that neutralizes the acid in the, the small intestine. So what we call this is intestinal metaplasia. Um, in meta meaning change, um, if you remember that from, you know, the thousand science courses that you've taken thus far. Um, and, and what we see is that um, the esophagus, which is usually a squamous epithelium, as we kind of talked about, and as we kind of see in part of this biopsy, um, we see it kind of changed at the GE junction. And that is an issue um, because we see that now in order to uh, really deal with the increased damage um, at the, uh, you know, above the lower esophageal sphincter. So we know the esophagus is like a tube like this. And here's the lower esophageal sphincter. And it, you know, it kind of goes into the stomach like this. Um, so we know if this is loosened up and it's exposed to acid, the esophageal cells are going to change to be a type of cell that can deal with that. And what's the big deal about this? It predisposes the patient to um, malignancy. Um, and that's called what? Do you guys know what that's called? So if we know that metaplasia is change, um, and we know that malignancy, we call that adenocarcinoma, what's that middle stage, that kind of um, precancerous lesion, if you will? Neoplasia, yet yeah, sort of, sort of. Um, somebody said it before, looking at the, the endoscopy. So that's our friend uh, Barrett's esophagus. So you guys are right there. And, and when we talk about this, it's kind of a spectrum, okay? Um, so what, what we kind of see is um, we see um, GERD or, or acid reflux, and then we see, you know, that change to, to uh, metaplasia, and then we see that change to um, dysplasia. That's the problem. Dysplasia is the issue. Um, and that's what we kind of want to avoid. And we want to avoid it going to adenocarcinoma. And, and yes, you know, there is another type of cancer that we can get in the esophagus that's called squamous cell carcinoma, but the sweeping majority of um, esophageal cancers are adenocarcinomas, especially in the Western United States where, you know, um, a lot of our, our population tends to be um, larger with a uh, poor diet. Um, those are the type of things that, um, you know, predispose you to have acid reflux and increased exposure of acid in the, in the esophagus, okay? So, um, let's see. In terms of the Baird's esophagus, we'll talk about that pretty quickly here. Um, what that is, is it's metaplasia, as we kind of talked about, of the normal esophagus um, to resemble the intestine. So we call that um, intestinal metaplasia, as we kind of talked about. Where does it come from? Prolonged exposure to stomach acid or GERD. Um, and, and the way we classify it is no dysplasia. So if we take a biopsy, um, and there's no dysplasia, we just see metaplasia, um, that's what we call it, or low grade or high grade. And the treatment is based on that classification. So if there's no dysplasia, we might give them proton pump inhibitors. Those are friends like uh, omeprazole. Um, and um, th that's like Prilosec. You probably see a thousand commercials on TV for it a day. Um, or um, pantoprazole or isomeprazole, those um, azoles, that's what the proton pump inhibitors are. It inhibits the stomach acid, um, the actual protons from being released in the st stomach, hence sort of uh, minimizing that uh, acid secretion um, mechanism of the stomach. 
Um, if there's low grade dysplasia, um, we might choose to um, do an ablation therapy. So radio frequency ablation, um, and then kind of uh, survey these pa patients over um, a period of time or at one year. If there's high grade dysplasia, we basically will do um, radio frequency ablation at that point. And um, later, if there's adenocarcinoma, which is um, you know a, a frank cancer of the esophagus, we might do um, endoscopic mucosal resection. So we get in the esophagus, um, we we put um, a solvent, um, inject it underneath the tumor, and then kind of cut it out. Um, and, and that's how we kind of get rid of that. Um, and then often the, the patients will do um, some sort of neoadjuvant, um, meaning before the uh, chemo um, or chemo and radiation, usually just chemotherapy though, not um, necessarily radiation for that. All right, um, and, and this over here, um, I think it's above your pay grade at this point. Um, but if you're if you're you know ever so interested, you can read it yourself. It's kind of how we um, it's the the um, prog um, classification. So so how we kind of um, grade the um, the uh, Barrett's esophagus um, that we find um, when we see it. We we call it C uh, a C component and an M component based on the the length of of where the GE junction is. Okay. So let me clear all this junk and we'll keep going here um, on to our next case. All right, and if I could get another reader, please. Uh, I can read. A 78 year old male presents with a two month history of dysphagia and halitosis. He notes that he recently had a dental exam of which was unremarkable. Occasionally he awakens and regurgitate with regurgitated food on his pillow. Perfect. Thank you very much for reading. And you picked you picked a good one to read. This was like three sentences. So you uh you really win, you win there. Um, so my question for you is um, so it fairly short vignette, um, but I think I gave you the information that you need to know. What's the next best step here? Out of all this, the you know, tools that we've kind of, you know, uh, talked about so far, what do you want to do? This patient has dysphagia, halitosis, which means uh, it's a acute medical way of saying like really bad breath. Um, these are the halitosis is the sort of medical synonym for these people run you out of the room with, with their breath. It's very, very bad. Um, but, you know, halitosis um, it is not pathognomonic, meaning, you know, it doesn't point you in the direction of one thing. It can, you know, be multiple things. But he had a dental exam um, that was unremarkable. So it's not his teeth. Um, but he has regurgitated food on his pillow. So um, what do you guys want to do for this gentleman? He's like, I have pillow, I have pillow food and um, I, you know, have bad breath and I cannot swallow. What are you guys going to do? Barium swallow. Good. Um, and what are you looking for, Josh? You guys have to know why you're doing these things. And then that's what I want to teach you kind of up front is, you know, you have to know why you're ordering these tests. Um, and I know, I know it's hard at your level um, to kind of, it's like shooting arrows in the dark, truly. But um, you have to know what you're kind of looking for. So so have an idea in your head of why I'm, I'm ordering these things. And when you do that, you're kind of keeping in your head, you know, I'm ruling in this or I'm ruling out that or, you know, what have you, you know, whatever way you kind of, of, of slice it there. So um, Josh says normal swallowing function and yeah, in any physical abnormality, certainly. Yeah, that's what we want to look for. Good. And um, is there anything that you guys are looking, what can be contributing to this gentleman's halitosis here? Yeah, undigested food, certainly. So um, you guys get a barium swallow because um, Josh is um, a very uh, smart um, medical student. Um, sphincter too tight, absolutely. We're gonna talk about that as well. So good, Sammy, um, perfect. Here's your barium swallow, voila. And somebody put an arrow on it. So they are, are throwing you a bone here. What is that? I alluded to it earlier when we talked introduction. Do you guys remember what that's called? Yeah, it's a diverticulum. It's called a specific one though. 
Do you guys remember what it, it's called? Um, it is a diverticulum, which just means an outpouching of the mucosa. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people have um, diverticulosis of the colon, for instance, um, you know, a, a good significant portion of the population has a uh, colonic diverticulum more common in the sigmoid colon. Yeah, it's a zanker diverticulum. Good. Um, and uh, perfect. So you guys kind of pinpointed this one. It's a fairly simple one. But what this is, is it's a zanker's diverticulum. Okay. And it's a posterior herniation of the esophagus. And it's at Killian's triangle. And I put a little cartoon here to show you it. And what it is, is it's weakened area um, above the cricopharyngeus muscles to so this, this guy right here and below the inferior constrictor muscles. So it's kind of, you know, a weakness here. And as you can see from that kind of, um, that lateral angle of that barium swallow, we do see that posterior herniation, um, where, um, from the swallowing the barium, it kind of contrasts in the, um, esophagus. So we're able to see that. How do we diagnose it? Barium swallow as we kind of, um, as we kind of talked about. And then um, how do we treat this? Um, two different ways, an endoscopic approach or a, um, or a surgical approach. But you kind of see here, um, and we can see, you know, that posterior herniation here, all right, when we see it endoscopically. And um, endoscopically, you can go in and fix it. We, we kind of, um, it, it's uh, pretty involved in terms of, you know, a lot of people can, can clip it um, and, and then, um, fix it endoscopically. Um, but you know, that's above all of our pay grades at this point, I think. All right. Um, let me show you this quick video of the swallow, um, study this, uh, you know, barium swallow for, um, this Zanker's diverticulum. Cause I want you to kind of see how it contrasts, um, in the esophagus. So let me go here because I think the patient swallows bigger boluses in the beginning, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so do you guys see that? It's kind of in this area right here and it's kind of hanging out. It's not as kind of um, proximal as our guys' um, zankers, but you can see that and you can see the food kind of hanging out there um, and, and, and staying there. So it's kind of that um, barium is mixed with that pudding and you're able to see it, um, kind of back there posteriorly. All right. So that's an example of the barium swallow where we can kind of identify that. All right. So let's keep going, uh, off to our last case now. Um, let's get one more person to read our final case. You guys are going to make me read it. A, six, a 62 year old oh. female presents after vomiting cup fulls of blood. The patient knows that she has a history of non alcoholic fatty acid liver disease. The patient describes occasional dark, tarry stools. The patient has tenderness in the epigastrium on an exam and dry blood on her lips. Perfect. Thank you very much for reading. So um, we see that there might be a G, I believe, going on here, which kind of uh, perks up our ears. So she's vomiting cupfuls of blood, which is pretty significant, um, has the history of fatty liver disease, um, and she has dark tarry stools. So you guys tell me if you remember from um, if you watched my very first um, virtual round session a thousand years ago, um, what cupfuls of bright red blood mean if the patient's vomiting it? Um, does that mean upper GI bleed or lower GI bleed? Upper, good. And then if the patient has dark tarry stools, what does that mean? More likely lower, but you guys who said upper aren't actually wrong. So um, it, um, or it, it, I mean, it is primarily um, upper because it is di or digested blood. 
Um, though it, it, it's, you know, this kind of um, uh, this, you know, mix between upper and lower GIs are sort of um, are, are kind of cut off at the ligament of trite, which is kind of a, around the duodenum area. So when we see dark tarry stools, that usually means digested blood. So it depends on where it kind of came from. So it can be upper or lower. Um, usually it has to be high enough that it has been digested. But we know that if it's bright red blood um, per rectum, that's usually lower GI. So I, I kind of threw you yeah, a trick question there really. Um, the patient has tenderness and she has dry blood on her lips. So what are you guys ordering at this point to rule in or rule out um, GI bleed? CBC, yeah, definitely. What are you looking at for the CBC specifically, Madeline? RBC, yeah, definitely. I, I not necessarily the RBC though. I'm looking at um, I'm looking at the hemoglobin to see um, what this patient's hemoglobin is. That's what we kind of you know trend to see if this patient um, is anemic and needs blood urgently. They're less than seven. You know, obviously we're going to be um, doing some sort of intervention to stop this GI bleed or figure out where this GI bleed is coming from. But we also want to resuscitate this patient too if they're less than seven uh, milligrams per deciliter on their hemoglobin. Um, similarly, we're gonna wanna resuscitate them with fluids um, and get their pressure up, see what their pressure is. Um, and then Jonathan said um, endoscopy, and I agree with you. Um, and um, let's see, so Madeline asked for CBC. So here's your CBC, Madeline, and it's right at the cutoff um, for the hemoglobin. Um, 7.2, we're, we're definitely going to want to volume resuscitate this patient, especially if they're bleeding. Um, usually we're going to want to trend this because um, when you bleed at first, because you're uh, losing whole blood, um, the, the hemoglobin will catch up kind of later. Same thing when you resuscitate. Um, when, you, uh, when you resuscitate, you're basically replacing um, only part of the, the volume. And so you're going to get a shift in the, the hemoglobin as well. Okay. So um, here's your endoscopy. We do an endoscopy and we see this. What is this? Um, do you guys know? Yeah, it's esophageal varices. Good. Um, and, and they're the same kind of, you know, word that we think of when we think of um, varicosities on the lower extremities. We know that the blood is getting pooled in veins. Um, here it's the esophageal veins um, as they kind of um, come up uh, from the, um, the, the gastric veins up to the esophagus. So my question for you guys is why does this patient have esophageal varices? She's not an alcoholic. Why does she have esophageal varices? Yeah, she has liver disease. And what does her liver disease do that actually causes these varices? Close. So it does, liver disease does cause a, a clotting problem and, in, and, and results in a um, decreased synthetic function of the liver. So albumin drops, clotting factors drop. But the reason why these people bleed is because of the, the, cl the clotting problem. But the reason why the varices is not because of the clotting problem, if that makes sense. So there is a history of fatty liver disease, certainly. Um, the blood is backed up. Excellent. Madeline, we're getting warmer. Um, why is the blood backed up? So if we think about this patient has fatty liver disease, what's happening in the liver that's causing the blood to back up? There's one word that I'm kind of looking for here. High pressure in the liver. Excellent. Close. It, it's getting very close. So we think about it. Yeah, it's scarring. It's cirrhosis. Excellent, Seema. Good. So we're, when we think about this, and, and we'll go on to this next slide here where, where we can kind of talk about this a little bit more. And I, I made this patient, you know, I, when I wrote this case, I wrote it as a, a fatty liver disease patient because, you know, if I, I said, you know, um, an, an alcoholic um, or, you know, hepatitis, I think you guys would have thought about it quicker. But this is kind of your lesson in, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease can cause cirrhosis and does cause cirrhosis. Um, I saw a patient, um, I think it was last week or the week before, that had pretty significant 
um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease had, you know, advanced cirrhosis from it and required banding for the esophageal varices. So this, you know, I, I wrote this case almost to parallel that, that patient that I saw last week. So um, basically what this is, is varicosities in the esophagus. That's what we talked about, um, esophageal varices, just dilated veins in the esophagus. And it's due to increased portal pressure. And when we say, okay, what's portal pressure? Portal pressure is the pressure in um, the, the portal veins and the portal system kind of um, connects with other uh, veins as we can see here. So um, if we, oops, let me clear that so I can move this out of the way. So when we look down here um, at this kind of cartoon here, we see um, the liver um, and, and we see the portal vein here. And when we see, we get all this scarring and nodularity in the liver. Um, and, and then we get scarring in between the, the islands. Um, and, and we get this increased pressure because of the, the scarring. Um, we get kind of these uh, dilated veins because the, the blood has nowhere else to go, basically. It's getting all kind of backed up. Um, and as a result, um, what we see is kind of those, those varices. Um, and, and how do we fix this? Um, it depends if it's, you know, not severe or, you know, grade um, zero or one, um, grade zero, meaning they're there. Um, but when we put the endoscope down, um, when we, um, when we puff air on them, when we do air insufflation, they kind of go down, um, we might get beta blockers at that point. If the patient is, um, you know, uh, like this, um, or like our patient we saw in um, ours, where they had those kind of red whales on it. That's what we call those red whales. Um, then we um, usually ligate um, those um, through banding. And, and it's exactly what it seems like. It's these little um, rubber bands that kind of, um, you know, uh, kind of band them up. Okay. And we diagnose them through EGD, um, this kind of, uh, chart over here to the right um, addresses GI bleeding. Um, and, and our side is kind of over here. So we're, we're admitting this patient to the hospital. Um, we might use octreotide, which is a somatostatin inhibitor, um, non-selective beta blockers. And we also give broad spectrum antibiotics as well. Um, and if this patient is in fact um, cirrhotic, we would give them broad spectrum antibiotics, usually a third generation cephalosporin, um, like ceftriaxone in order to um, avoid spontaneous um, bacterial peritonitis, which is an infection of the um, ascites fluid in the belly, which is um, very uh, a high a high rate of mortality for these cirrhotic patients. All right, um, and then what we do to treat it is we band it, and then. Um, if the patient is getting rebleeding from it, we might consider doing a TIPS procedure, um, transjugular intrahepatic um, portosystemic shunt. And it's basically putting a, um, a shunt in the liver to shunt blood away from um, the, the, the places where it's backing up. What's the problem with this? Ammonia can go up and that can cause encephalopathy um, and confusion in the brain. Okay. There are other causes of, um, you know, GI bleed, obviously upper GI bleed. We can consider peptic ulcers. We consider um, AV malformations, um, a um, Dulafoy lesion or a, a Mallory Weiss tear. That's usually people who are retching um, alcoholics. That's uh, one of them. Um, anorexic and bulimic patients who are retching often, or just people who are really sick and vomiting often. Um, we can also have erosive esophagitis um, um, or pill esophagitis. Something that we can have pill esophagitis from is like bisphosphonates, big kind of pills that um, people take for osteoporosis or um, like tetracyclines is common for it. Um, and, and obviously we can find no source for it. And then that's where we might want to do, um, you know, colonoscopy or um, a capsule endoscopy where they swallow a little camera and kind of watch it as it goes or um, a CT angiogram, okay? And those have their limitations as well. All right, so that's kind of what I have to say about that. And then finally, I have a few slides here at the end where we're gonna kind of go through and then it, it's almost like a rapid fire um, guess, if you will, um, of what you guys think these are, okay? So uh, first things first, this. Um, we kind of talked about this in terms of um, you know, exposure to stomach acid as kind of a mechanism. Um, what do you guys think that is? We're looking at the esophagus, by the way. Yep. 
You'll see an art ulcer in a second. Um, it's not an ulcer. It's not Barrett's. Think about it in terms of exposure to stomach acid um, over a long period of time. People have sort of dysphagia and um, basically what it looks like on, um, if we looked at it another way is like this. I know this is a beautiful drawing. Yeah, it's a stricture. So good. So we kind of see this um, little um, hindrance here from um, stomach acid. So instead of, you know, doing uh, or, or, you know, being metaplasia, um, it, it's, it's a stricture. So this is esophageal stricture. And you may see these pictures later on your quiz. Um, I, the quiz is a lot of pictures. I think you guys should be able to finish it fairly quickly. And I try to make them not very hard for you. All right, what's this? This is also the esophagus, um, but we see this white kind of, um, it's often described, you know, cottage cheese. Um, it is the same organism that causes thrush, but it's in the esophagus. Yeast, yeah, it's candidiasis. It's a, it's a candida infection. So it is yeast, exactly. Um, we usually treat this with a fluconazole. Um, we see this in people of whom are immunocompromised. It's an AIDS-defining illness, so good. All right, somebody already said this. What's this? And if you're if you're lost, if you need an arrow, um, here we go. We're looking at this. Yeah, it's an ulcer. Excellent. Good. You guys are getting good. All right, and what is this? This one's kind of hard actually. So I'll tell you this one. This one is eosinophilic esophagitis and what we're kind of seeing, yeah, good. So Gabriella knew that, excellent. So um, we see here um, tracheolization of the esophagus. And we say that because the esophagus now looks like the trachea where there's rings. So we see this kind of rings, we see the linear, linear furrows. And what we see when we take a biopsy is a bunch of eosinophils in the mucosa um, or in the sample, okay? And we usually, um, usually this is a cause of dysphagia, um, kind of acid reflux symptoms in, in younger, um, younger males usually. Okay, um, it's kind of a, a curious one. Um, and here is another one. We see kind of um, this um, hypertensive um, lower esophageal sphincter or tight lower esophageal sphincter down here. Do you remember what this one's called? I don't know if I actually told you. Oh, good. So Gabriella says achalasia, and she would be absolutely right. And if we look back on our uh, manometry studies, when we saw, you know, um, here's the upper, um, here's the the upper um, esophageal sphincter, and then down here is the lower esophageal sphincter, um, and then we tell the patient to swallow. What we might see is kind of um, a huge increased pressure down here at the lower esophageal sphincter. Okay. Um, and, and that's going to kind of tell us about the pressure that's going on there. So that's a way that we can use that manometry study to um, determine that this is, in fact, achalasia. Curiously, um, another way that we can get achalasia, it's called pseudoachalasia, is from um, Chagas disease. Um, and, and that's a kind of pseudoachalasia, um, if you will. Okay. I think I have one more. Yes. What is this one? We did talk about this one. I know we did. So this patient comes in with chest pain. Um, is like you know sometimes I have swallow or trouble swallowing um, when this happens. Yeah, it's esophageal spasm. Excellent. We call this diffuse esophageal spasm. And what we might see um, on that manometry study, and you can look it up and, and kind of Google it, as we kind of talked about, here's the upper esophageal sphincter, here's the lower, we might see kind of, you know, increased pressure here, increased pressure here as they swallow, increased pressure here, increased pressure here. So it, we kind of see that spasm as they're kind of um, swallowing. So good, you guys did great with that. I think that's my last one. 
which it's like a shock to probably me and you that I finished on time um, because I usually never do. Um, so before you all go, um, let me let me uh, launch my um, my final um, poll here. Let me relaunch it so you can see it. Um, and, and go ahead um, and, and answer now where you think you kind of stand in terms of um, how much you know about esophageal disorders. And then I will stick around for a, a few minutes afterwards if you guys have any questions about the esophagus or about um, medical school or the personal statement or um, anything along those lines. Um, I'm happy to talk about anything. Um, I think most of you guys are in here. Let's see, so I can share it. What medical school am I at? I go to um, Burrell College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's in, um, I don't know why I was uh, blinking out. It's in uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. It's about an hour or so from El Paso, Texas. Um, I'm from um, Albuquerque. So that's uh, about four hours from there if, if you're not familiar with New Mexico. All right, so let me, um, let me launch this for you. I'll kind of share the results here. So the uh, sweeping majority of you said, you know, some, which I'm very humbled by. One person said they know nothing, which is a little sad um, for, for, for you and me for not knowing anything. Um, uh, you need a little hope of the soap note. Um, I'll definitely go through that for you, um, Adrian. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm very humbled. Thank you guys for, for coming. Um, I'm glad you guys learned um, a little bit here. Um, and if you guys have any questions about anything, um, feel free to, you can always unmute yourself or um, type it through the chat. But for the first question, let me go to um, the soap note here so we can chat about that real quick. Let's see, okay, there it is. So here's the soap note form. Um, that's kind of what you're gonna see when you go to that link I provided you. And basically what we're gonna do um, here is kind of type out the history. So for instance, if we're talking about the um, Zanker guy, for instance, we, and when we write the history of present illness, we might say, um, this is a, I forgot what I put him as, like a 66 year old male um, presenting for um, dysphagia. Uh, what else did we say? Um, and then we would say, you know, pertinent positives and negatives. Um, the patient notes that they have um, dysphagia to um, solids and liquids along with halitosis, um, negative, negative dental exam recently. So this is kind of what the, the HPI is. And inadvertently, I'm including the, the ROS in there, the kind of pertinent positives and negatives for that. Um, and then, you know, it, to add it in to based on the other stuff that we learned this time, we might say, you know, no um, acid reflux or heartburn symptoms, symptoms, um, no nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea, um, no home treatments um, to say, you know, this patient hasn't done anything or hasn't done anything at home for this. So that's a decent RO or HPI to kind of include everything that we need for um, the subjective part. Objective is things that we um, kind of find. So, um, you know, it, uh, for, that's basically the physical exam. So if we palpated the abdomen, we would say, I didn't really give you vital signs for this. Um, you can make them up if you wanted to. Um, we could say, you know, for the physical exam, um, we could say, you know, heart is um, regular rate and rhythm. We could say lungs are clear to auscultation bilaterally. Um, just kind of make this up because I didn't give you everything. Um, and I think I told you tenderness to palpation in the epigastrium. Um, so we might put all that in the, the, um, that part. And then when we get down to assessment, we would say, okay, number one, um, Zanker diverticulum. And then how would we treat it? Um, usually I, I write mine like this, um, where I put what it is and then how I would treat it. So for the, um, for the um, Zanker, uh, we would put um, how we would treat it. We would put endos consider endoscopic or um, surgical um, 
surgical treatment for this patient. Um, we might do um, also liquid diet, soft foods to prevent aspiration. Um, and, and that's about it for this. It's fairly simple for this because I gave you many cases. You'll see how the soap note kind of turns out for um, larger cases where I give you vitals and I give you um, and I give you the physical exam and everything and I give you multiple assessments and all of that stuff. But that's basically the kind of stuff that you're going to write here. Um, and, and this is really just practice for you to kind of get practice writing out the soap note because this is the way we write um, kind of in our medical documentation. Okay.